Yeah, good, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you, Max. Um, yeah, before you, like, what, what's, what's been happening? So you're at, um, oh yeah, we can't mention where you're at, but you're doing your pediatric anesthesia fellowship. That's right. Yeah, right. I'm about, I'm, I'm two weeks in. It's only a year long. And then afterwards, we'll see what happens. But oh, right now, I'm actually back where I was in residency, which is at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. And uh, I'm actually in, clearly in an operating room, operating theater right yeah, now. Right. So, how, hey, how, long, now? how long did you do pediatric anesthesiology for? It's, <laughs> the fellowship is, is one year. Oh, good. So oh, you're, you're doing the full fellowship. Oh, nice. That's right. That kids... Pete Pete scares me the most out of everything. That's, I think I think that's what most of our colleagues say. And we you know we have a group that do just pediatrics, but every now and again we've got to do pediatrics uh, as an emergency on the evening shift. It's always an extra level of, uh, you know, I've I've got to be really sharp for this case. There's yes. something about that that really adds to the job security for me. Is the fact <laughs> that uh, <laughs> most people just don't uh, not that most people don't enjoy working with kids, but the uh, yeah. it, the anesthesia aspect of working with, with young patients can, can be scary. Yeah. And I think what it is viscerally, when you walk into a PEDS OR, and if it's, if it's really a young patient um, and you hear the heart rate is 150 and that's a normal <laughs> heart rate for that patient, um, that can, if you're not used to that or not expecting that, I think that can also cause you yourself to become tachycardic. So yeah, um, that's right. But it, isn't it funny? Like when the, um, Heart rate gets to a normal rate of like 50. You're like, oh, this is really bad. Right. Really bad. Yeah. 50 is when chest compressions start typically in a, <laughs> a, a pizza operating. So I, I, scary. I've been in a place just recently, yeah, like a two year old, you know, 10, 10 kilos, like this, this so tiny, even at, at you know, two years of age. And um, yeah, just desatted to 50% like that. Just to have, right. to have, have trouble ventilating. They were reacting on the ventilator. Oh, it's just. Um, yeah, definitely um, put a couple of more gray hairs each time those things happen. Right. Yeah. How about you? What's new? What's new? Yeah. Um, actually, you know what? Yeah, just a Ministry of Sound is playing. I don't know if you heard of Ministry of Sound, but when I was a teenager, yeah, that, that was the album that, you know, everyone listened to. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, um, yes, yeah, so it just went to, we went yesterday, had a really massive day of, you know, full Ministry of Sound DJs and then, uh, today we're going to back it up with another couple of hours as well. Um, yeah, so then we'll have to get into at some point, do you play Ministry of Sound in the operating room? I don't want to have any spoiler alerts <laughs> that, yeah, right, right now, but uh, that, <laughs> that could be the, the segue. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, no, so um, uh, work, work, is, work is pretty good. I mean, uh, like I literally just plug away at ABCs of anesthesia on the off time, and then, oh, you know what we had? We had recruitment for the, the I don't know how it goes with you guys, but we have an we have, you, know, you do an internship, uh, second year out residency position, but that's not a training position. And then most people have to do a, an unaccredited anesthesia position called a critical care year. And so we had 240 applicants uh, apply for our four jobs. And it was just a harrowing process, like, you know, shortlisting them down to, you know, we, we shortlisted 13 and, you know, interviewing these just amazing people. And you know, any, any, like I reckon any of the, probably any of the top 30, 40 would be, fine in terms of their capabilities and passing exams and all that kind of stuff but to have to only offer jobs to four people is just it's just brutal <laughs> i i don't envy whoever's making that decision you're involved with the decision making process then yeah yeah, yeah. um how, how did you guys ha have it was it um you start with um uh you know your internship and then you go straight into your residency which is like, which is a training program isn't it Right. So for the most part, there are, there are some exceptions to this, but for the most part, the internship is packaged with the rest of residency. In some cases, it's, it's separate. Um, but certainly in anesthesia, the trend is mostly that it's all packaged together. So the yeah. first year of residency, that term is synonymous then with internship. And so then the second year of residency, which would be the postgraduate year two of training, is the first year that you get exposure or really full-time exposure to anesthesiology. Yeah. Um, but you would be considered uh, a PGY2 at that point. And so here, the whole package is, is yeah. four years of residency training, where the first year is the internship and then you, fellowship. Yeah. There's, so there's a good chance that you didn't have to do any annoying rotations. You didn't have to do the gen, general medical. So know. depending on where you go, 
the rotations that you do as an intern can be annoying. It really depends on what you are enthusiastic about. Yeah. Um, we, where I trained, we do um, a number of months of surgery. And so my residency class was pretty split in terms of how enthusiastic we were about surgery. Some people were enthusiastic, wanted to get in the operating room, wanted to scrub. I was one of those people. I can't explain why that was intriguing to me. Um, yes. But then, you know, the other half of my class uh, just wanted to see patients on the floor, not be scrubbed into the OR and that sort of thing. Um, see, and then, that's good. And then, as long as other people that do, do what you or want, what you don't want, then you have a great rotation. It all great. balances out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the big differences between the training in the United States and then the training in basically the rest of the civilized world for anesthesia is the amount of time that we spend doing critical care or the really the expectation of whether we're doing critical care after we're done with our training. Mm -hmm. So in the U.S., we are not expected to attend an ICU after we're done with our anesthesia training. We do. I think mm -hmm. there is a mandate to do four months of critical care medicine during residency. Mm -hmm. um, but then we don't go practice critical care medicine. In fact, that's a, that's a, its own fellowship. Um, whereas yeah. I think everywhere else, anesthesiologists also attend an ICU, right? Yeah. Like we've, we've got to have, oh, so some, so we have to do three months ICU minimum. A lot of people do more than that, but like, fortunately we don't have to do the, the double qualification. Whereas I think in the UK they do far more ICU time. And I think in Ireland they have to do both, which yeah. you know, makes a bit of sense, but also. Uh, I, I know that IC was not for me. It is, it is so different, even though it seems pretty similar. Yeah. If you could pin it on one thing, what is it about ICU that uh, <laughs> that you shy away from the most? Oh, that's a good question. Ugh. I I actually feel quite um <laughs> this, this you know you don't want people to take this wrong way, but I get quite bored on those on any kind of ward round. I get, get I get a bit bored, but especially the ICU, yeah on the rounds and when yeah. like you know in IC they really keen at like they're really into stuff that i doesn't interest me like phosphate levels or you know like in anesthesia you, you really talk about what matters exactly when it matters and you could you, you don't have time for any kind of extra high level cerebral theoretical stuff so i never get bored in anesthetics <laughs> whereas in icu i was like why are we still talking about this let's let's just go to the next patient let's get this other let's get let's get the lines and the tubes in and keep this patient alive yeah, when I rotated through the ICU, you could always tell who was the anesthesia trained intensivist because rounds were always much more expedient uh, <laughs> yeah, on, right. on average. Uh, you yeah, could tell you who was the trained. When the um, consultant takes the handover from the re registrar on the, you know, after the night shift, if the registrar was an anesthetic train, the patient is alive, you know, art line, tube, everything is good, but they have no idea what's going on. But when the physician trained ICU registrar, hands over, they go, look, I know exactly what's wrong, but sorry, the patient died. <laughs> I, think, I think that's highly, you know, some, somewhat accurate, really. Hey, so, you know, obviously this is our first live stream, like some, there's, you know, there's definitely comments coming through and can you see the comments on your side? Let me, let me try and pull this up. I'm a noob, so please bear with me with the, yeah. uh, with the live chat. Okay, I can look at the live chat here. See okay. a couple of comments. The anesthesia boys. Yeah. Okay, that's us. Hi, the anesthesia. And, that, that's uh, us. <laughs> and then, oh, so the comments fade away after oh, yeah. for a second. Uh, Santiago says, in Mexico, we also have an intern year followed by a year of social service, and then we go into residency. So I actually spent a year um, doing research in Colombia and South America, and mm. uh, there was also a year of social service that the uh, graduates were expected to do. What's um, on, what's on some grad some what is a social service? What does that mean? Um, so at least in the context of uh, Colombia, that meant going to an underserved area. And typically that meant going out into a rural area mm -hmm. that had limited access to healthcare and then being essentially the community physician um, mm -hmm. who's there uh, without, a, you know, a lot of healthcare infrastructure. Yeah. Hey, and, what and I that was, yeah. might I, oh, that's good. Sorry. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, might I actually um, ask the audience a few things like, you know, if, Tell us where you're from, um, you know, pretty much what, what time zone you're in, because obviously this might be pretty late and might be in weird areas. But also, if you have any, we're not really sure exactly, like we, we, we want to talk about music in the operating theatre, but also just thinking about, you know, if you, if, I'm not sure what the makeup of the audience is, are they medical professionals, healthcare professionals, or just general public? If you have any questions, just type it in the chat and we'll probably, um, you know, spend a bit of time just, you know, just 
riffing and going through some of those answers as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, and while we wait for those questions, oh, Max, that's fan. That's that <laughs> true. So we can also we can have this conversation with Um as far as uh, waiting for people to uh, to to um, ask any questions, I'll start by asking you a question, which is, uh, mm. I think, just starting at the top level. Do do you listen to music in the operating room? Yeah, I do. I do. But I've got it's yeah. it's, it's it's a strange thing. I, I didn't used to because it was extremely distracting for me. And then one day I was in. I just become a consultant, niece to this, and I started a private list. And the surgeon said, "Hey, well, here, where's the music?" And I thought, what, what, what do you mean? Like, it, it was all his other releases were responsible for the music. So I actually bought one of those little Logitech speakers and, uh, you know, the UE Boom, chucked it in the corner. And I, then I created this playlist called the Theatre Playlist. And now I've got some ridiculous amount of followers who follow that operating theatre playlist. Um, huh. You'll have and, to send that to me. I need to, I need to check that out. I'm looking for some new music. Yeah. And, and it's funny because you've almost got to have obviously nothing too crazy, nothing too hardcore swearing all that kind of stuff but you got to appeal to you know we have a lot of filipino nurses and they love their karaoke we have a lot of you know anglo aussie nurses um who they have a particular taste of um kind of the classic aussie rock and then everyone else in between who just loves pop music and commercial and and so you have something for everyone and the at the end of the day the number of times a nurse goes oh hey thanks so much for the playlist or thanks so much for music it's just so common and i, I just love that that's all it takes to create a good mood yeah. Um, so, so let me ask you the flip side of that. So I, I have heard some anesthesiologists complain that they feel like it is not their job to be the DJ and they feel like it's an undue burden that other people expect. Uh, really? what, what would you, what would you say to someone who you've never heard anyone complain about that before? No, I, I know that there's a few anesthetists who definitely know on music and there's always a bit of a problem. So in the plastic surgery list, the plastic surgeons always take control of the operating of the music and one of my colleagues hates music and so you know she she just doesn't allow it and that's that's always a problem uh whereas you know from my point of view if something goes wrong for me i need the music to stop straight away so it's far better that i've got my finger on the pause or on the um, sound level whereas if the surgeon's got control of it you know their problems happen you know, in a longer time frame generally so you know, they can get one of the scrub nurses to turn stuff down. So yeah, I, I always make sure I've got control of it. How, how about you, sir? So I've, I've oscillated over time, keeping in mind that I've only really been doing anesthesia for a little over three years at this point, mm -hmm. right? So I'm a PGY five now. So two, three, and four were, uh, were anesthesia for me. I started off being really enthusiastic about DJing. And so I would bring a speaker into the operating room get it set up and, you know, try and sort of feel out exactly what you're describing. Um, you know, what, what's the audience interested in and we should definitely talk about, you know, there are generalizations that you can make based on, on which service you're in the, in the operating room with operating theater. Um, so I really enjoyed that for a while, but then I also found from a, from a logistical standpoint, this is definitely an anesthesiologist problem. This is not an anyone else problem. When I would get breaks, I would leave the operating room and yeah. disconnect the Bluetooth oh. connection with my speaker. And then I'd come back and yeah. have to reconnect. And, you know, we get several breaks throughout the course of the day. So, yeah. you know, if I'm in a long spine surgery, that's a, a number of times that I end up so, having to disconnect and reconnect. People, people are always surprised when I actually say, the first thing I do when I come into the operating theater is put my laptop open, put on Spotify, and put the speakers up. Um, so you don't put, keep a laptop in the theater. Uh, no, it's on, it's on your phone. Yeah, right. And and that's so, right. when I was training, I would never put a laptop open in theater. The you know my consultant, my boss would think, what are you, what are you doing? Pay attention. But if not, because I'm the boss now, it's okay because that's part of the environment. And you know, I you know, look up articles, look up research, or whatever it is. It's all on the laptop, and and we run the electronic medical record remotely through my laptop as well. So it's it's totally kosher. Yeah. If I, as a trainee right now, opened a laptop in the operating room, I would no longer be a trainee, I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> I think it would be, it would be all over. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I started off being really enthusiastic about it, but then, you know, the logistical issues kind of came up. And I also, I think just owing to lack of creativity, <laughs> I didn't come up with any new playlist. So I found myself listening to the same, you know, 
five or six playlists uh, throughout the course of the week. Um, and so I was just, I was bored of the music and you know, other people were enthusiastic about it. So I, I, I gave up my, my career as an OR DJ, at least <laughs> for the time being. For the time being. Yeah, it'll, you know, once, once you're in charge, it'll, it'll come back. Yeah. But yeah. What, what, do you, what do you think of them? Do you think it's dangerous? So I spent a little bit of time looking into this just to, just to have some, some baseline preparation for this conversation. Yeah. And well, the, the question that you asked is, do I think that it's dangerous? I, yeah. I, you had mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, when there's something amiss in the operating room, the volume needs to come down. And I think that just speaks to the point that um, mm-hmm. if, if there is something that's acute and critical that's happening, mm-hmm. then, um, then, I think music can be dangerous, particularly when it has the potential to impair communication mm. amongst everyone um, in the room. And it sounds like a silly thing, but even the the rape that's up between the anesthesia team and the um, nursing and, and surgical team on the other side, um, the drape plus the masks and then any background music, noise in an operating room plus music on top of that, I think um, can yeah. be detrimental if, if um, there's really critical communication that needs to occur. Outside of that, I think as long as the music's at a reasonable volume, and as you said, someone is able to quickly turn it off if it needs to go off, I think it's perfectly fine. And I, I, the, I, I'm curious to know your answer to that question. And then my follow-up question for you would be, do you think that there is a benefit that comes from it? Not just, is it, is it not dangerous, but is, is there actually something positive that comes from it? Yeah, I've, I've, yeah, I've got lots of thoughts on that. And again, yeah, I, I had to look at some stuff and, as I mentioned before, I actually asked ChatGPT and said, "Is you know, what are the dangers and benefits of music in the operating room?" And I came up with some really, really amazing responses so, as as AI does these days. But yeah, so I've got a few rules now because I realized that when I play the music, it has to be distant to me, so it can't be right there next to the monitor. I've got to have the sound of the monitor and the surgery as a separate directional thing from where the music is coming. So that's the first thing. Yeah loud and the, the volume is also definitely at a point where it's appropriate so if um i remember i was in orthopedic theater last week and they were noisy and the i think the airflow is noisy and they had the music up really high and so at that point i always have to put my alarms up and the sats turn up so just depending on all these other things i don't want to compete for the sound real estate you know i just really want to make sure that the priority is that and then yeah, so I have everything just set up so I can't be distracted. I can always hear all you know all these non order you know all the non visual cues the the sats pitch the um, pace of the tempo of that um, also you know just hearing the extra suction that might happen you know I, I want to make sure I can hear all those non visual cues and That's then such a critical sound to hear yeah. is extra suctioning from the field and yeah. I think it took a while for me in residency to really tune into that and and appreciate mm. the significance of uh, knowing that there's additional blood loss without having to look at the field or without having to have the surgeon tell me. Uh, yeah, that's right. Or, that, or if the surgeons yeah. are talking and then suddenly everyone's just deathly quiet. Like, oh, hey, right. what, what's what's going on there? What, why are you not as relaxed as you used to be? But yeah, so yeah. I remember having this thing now where, you know, when you, you have a crisis, so you might, you follow whatever doctors A, B, C, D or phase one, two, three, four of your management of your intraoperative problems. The first step in that now is turn music off. Absolutely. The very first time that I experienced or that a patient of mine experienced bronchospasm was was very early on in residency. It was early on enough that I was still paired with a preceptor Mm -hmm. attending anesthesiologist who basically didn't leave the the OR. It was my first month. Mm -hmm. And we ran into an issue on emergence, all of the stuff from bronchospasm. It was, you know, the patient dropped their sats and their pressure and I was trying to Mm -hmm. um, bag and, and I couldn't. And the, the very first, it was sort of an instinct thing. I said, turn the music off immediately. And then we proceeded from there. It's just, it, it's kind of a natural thing. Um, but you're right. That's basically step zero of, yes. uh, of any protocol. I'll also just comment because you brought up orthopedic surgery. Mm. The amount of noise in an ortho OR is outrageous. It basically yeah. just with the amount of drilling and sawing and, and everything that goes on. So, and, and at least... You know, my experience with orthopedic surgeons has generally been that they have a, a predisposition to listen to loud music yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> in, anywhere they go, including in the operating room. So that's, a, that's an extra layer of, of complexity. 
but yeah, so the the benefits. I think it's. I think that there's, I mean, there's so many benefits. Like literally, uh, yeah, you, you, maybe not even thinking about the anesthetists, but thinking about the scrub nurses. Often their job can be really boring. You know, like in a long case, they might just be retracting, or the intern might be retracting for hours, and to let that time fly by because you've provided good music. Because then, you know, in my hospital, they're generally not allowed to be in charge of the music. Or, you know, sometimes in one hospital they do, but most of the, mostly they don't. Um, the fact that they come up to you know, me regularly at the end and say, oh, thanks for the music, because it just makes everyone's day a little bit better to hear some great, great hits and stuff. So, you know, the patient might be sedated the, 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 you know, and hearing a bit of music if they're light sedated, lightly sedated. The, the team is just enjoying just the vibe that you create in the operating theater. So it's a good day. And then from yeah, my point of view, it's good to be not like you're engaged. Like you're, if you're in a good mood, you perform better. So you know that thing about what is better before your exams? Do you listen to classical music or whatever? It's actually whatever music makes you feel good. So that could be heavy metal or classical or pop or whatever it is. Like I, I watch comedies before I do any kind of thing, any, anything stressful. It just makes me, it puts me in a good mood. Um, even like before I'm about to do tough case overnight, sometimes I'll just, if I'm having a break beforehand, I'll just put on Ricky Gervais on YouTube and just have a couple of laughs and then get back to the you know, get, Do you Do you watch comedy before you record YouTube videos? No, uh, yeah, not at all. <laughs> That's not stressful. <laughs> yeah. um, how, how are you so? What are you, any other benefits? Like? Um, so the one study that I looked at suggested, it was a survey-based study, so. Take the, take the results for what you will, but suggested that that um, anesthesiologists and surgeons believe that music aids in their concentration mm. in the operating room. So um, I, you know, I think that could be a benefit as mm. well. You could kind of spin that a couple of different ways. I think you know, on the one hand, some uh, familiar music or or at least enjoyable music might help someone stay focused on their job. I think the, the sort of last half empty way of looking at it is, uh, mm. you know, helping someone who's, you know, just retracting for hours on it, help them just stay awake. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that counts as, as concentration either. Um, yeah, there was a... Yeah, there was, I mean, the study, like literally the first one that comes up on PubMed, like, you know, it's the influence of music on the surgical task performance, a systematic review. So probably the, the, of all the studies I, you know, could see on the first page of Google, this was probably the best. 2020 internal internal journal of surgery and press conclusion certain elements of music certain music elements affect the surgical task performance in a positive or negative way the total and significant outcome of the present study was that the positive effect of music on surgeons task performance overrides its negative effect classic classic music when played with a low to medium volume can improve the surgical task performance by increasing both accuracy and speed the distracting effect of music should be also be put into consideration when playing a loud or high beat type of music in the operating theaters. Oh, they all sound pretty cool, right? Yeah. It strikes me that that's basically a risk benefit discussion, which is akin to anything else that we would do in medicine. Mm. You know, yeah, it's kind of this... interesting to think about this as an intervention, so to speak, that comes with yeah. current risk and benefit. It, it, it is a bit. You know, actually, we were, just, we were having this massive debate yesterday. I was writing multi-choice questions for this new program uh, uh, where they, um, they've got a proper diploma for rural G general practitioners who are doing anesthesia training. So one-year training. And we're writing MCQs, and we had this whole debate about what is an absolute contraindication to, say, a spinal anesthetic. And you know, the, one of the options was, um, you know, platelets of 70 or 60. I'm like, no, no, no nothing, almost nothing is a absolute contraindication because if you right. if alternative is worse then you do the you know the the, the better the devil but you know yeah yeah do you think there are any absolute contraindications to music having said that a pa patient refusal is that, is that the i mean <laughs> that was the question that i was going to ask you about so you know maybe maybe something uh interesting to talk about as well mm -hmm. is, uh, or I, I really i'd be curious to know do you ever play music for patients before yes. oh. obviously right yeah, so it was, it was interesting. So every cesarean patient, I get, I say, hey, what, what would you like to listen to? Most of them say, whatever you got, doesn't matter. But recently, um, we had a, a Christian couple, and they just wanted their favorite, like, Christian rock band playlist. And, uh, like, you know, that was the first time someone specifically asked for a very particular genre of music. And they just they yeah. just loved it, you know. And it was, you know, it was, it was pleasant music. It wasn't 
heavy metal Christian rock. It was it was just very easy listening. And um, yeah. I think it was it was a really special moment for them. Because obviously, uh, that meant a big deal for them. They had their favorite song playing just as the baby was coming out. Yeah. Huh. That's amazing. Do you offer music to your patients in general ORs? Uh, oh, no, because, I mean, often there'll be... Um, uh, oh, gen- right, because you guys have induction rooms. Oh, we... we sorry, when they, ca- when they come in, it's such a short time frame that they come in. So, yeah, they've got an anesthetic room. They come into right. the theater and they get induced. So, oh, in, uh, in the eye theater, like when you're doing cataract anesthesia, then we put music in that room. It was often arm there, so I'll have music on. And plus when I'm blocking and all that, it allows them to just relax with a bit of midazolam and fentanyl. So, yeah. yeah. Huh. So, you know, it, it strikes me now that I think a major difference between how medicine is practiced in the United States and, again, basically everywhere else is that we, yeah. for the most part, don't have induction rooms. Um, oh. So patients come directly into the operating room um, yeah. and, you know, with, very few exceptions, pediatric patients being generally the exception. Patients don't get premedicated with yeah. much. I mean, it depends on the, the hospital, but <laughs> for the most part, don't get premedicated. So they come into the operating room, they see everything that's in here. So it, mm. it struck me that, you know, for patients who appear particularly mm. nervous, it might be nice to offer some music. So that is something that I've gotten in the habit of doing. But then you aren't wheeling awake patients who aren't premedicated into the operating theater, like that. oh, no, so so for every other case, we rarely premedicate them in the anesthetic room. They just come in. They often they walk in in some hospitals and they just lie on the bed. But yeah, no, we we we, we don't unless they tell us that it's a particularly harrowing experience. We don't do a lot of things to you know. Like it's, I, th- I think definitely in Australia, we're just like, oh, look, you know, you'll be fine. You know, it's very low risk surgery. Even if you're nervous, trust me, you'll be off to sleep in a couple of seconds. So yeah. it just never becomes a thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to pick up on that you mentioned is uh, the directionality of the music. And I, mm-hmm. I've never, I, I've never uh, really thought about it explicitly, but you're totally right. And I really try to avoid situations where I put the speaker right next to uh, like the, the, um, the vent or on the anesthesia cart back here, because then for anyone else to enjoy the music, I have to turn it up and then it's too loud. Um, and mm. so to that end, I'm actually, so since I'm, I'm in an operating room right now, I wanted, I wanted to show you this amazing setup that uh, yeah. is here in this particular room. So I'm, I'm actually oh, on, a, um, on a uh, gimbal here. And I'm going to turn this around and I just want to show you. So this is actually the music station in this particular operating room. Okay, um, you got a music station? Hold on. Basic. I don't know if they have a name for it, but that's, <laughs> that's what I call it. So um, okay. this, I mean, this is a subwoofer. This is a receiver and it, it's a really nice receiver. And then that's connected to an iPad that lives in this operating room. And it, wow. it literally is bolted down here with a uh, with yeah. a cable, wow. and then um, you know you can get on here and put on music. And then going back to your point about directionality, so there are mm. speakers that are installed. So this is this is a speaker, uh, and another one right up here, and then there are a couple that are uh, on the on the other side of the the operating room. So there's one right here. And yeah, another right. up here. So it's really excellent um, yeah. surround sound, and you you know you can put the music this... on at a reasonable volume. I'm, and I'm almost confused everywhere. I'm confused about why they would have such a decent setup when, yeah, like, as in, yeah, it, it seems like that's w- way too much overkill for it. Like, are they live streaming surgery somewhere? Is this so? It, in fact, yes. In this particular yeah. room. Can. Uh, there are surgeries that are that are part of a um, this, so this is a cardiothoracic surgery uh, yeah. room, and so there's a course that is offered, um, and uh, and so they do live stream through here, not publicly, yeah. um, but to people who are taking that course. And so to that end, they're actually there's a, I'll, I'll sort of turn this around here. Um, there's a camera that is right up uh, here as oh, well. Yeah. Our new our new theaters have those cameras, you know, pointing straight at where the operating 
is occurring and stuff. Do Dr. Yeah. Seth, uh, just on the chat, said, oh, look, that iPad and cable would be gone. I think he's from Mexico. Is, is that right, Cesar? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I feel I feel like we yeah, we definitely don't have an iPad, but I think, yeah, we, people, there's, there's a computer there. People just go onto Spotify and then just, um, oh, here we go. Uh, what is the name of your favorite Spotify players for theater? I personally use acoustic covers. Yeah, I love acoustic covers. I've, I've definitely taken a comp, like a whole bunch of stuff from acoustic covers and a happy playlist and made my own theater playlist. Um, I'm sure there's lots of theater playlists, but it's, uh, I think it's not even under my name. I've just uh, put a pseudonym as well. <laughs> yeah, um, there, so there are a lot of good um, uh, OR playlists on Spotify, but hmm. the one, like my go-to is Hip Hop Barbecue. Really, a, that seems to that seems to be um, <clears throat> pretty popular, depending on the operating room that you're in, right? So that's, um, I think, you know, knowing your audience <laughs> is an important aspect of this too. So, yeah. you know, hip hop barbecue will fly with the orthopedic surgeons, the general yeah. surgeons, uh, maybe the plastic surgeons, yeah. uh, the neurosurgeons. Okay. What kind of what kind of songs are on hip hop barbecue? Um, so this which, is which like '90s and 2000s hip hop, rap, some rock. See, that's that's so unusual in Australia. That would never go down. Huh. Like, like, like hip hop, rap, or any like, which is actually some of my favorite tracks. I can't put much of that on at all because it's it's so uncool to have that playing in the general kind of medical Aussie culture. Like, it's it's um, absolutely about. You know, uh, like you know, like rock music or you know, cl classic Auss Aussie stuff, um, or a bit like I don't know what's trendy in America, but trendy is probably like various forms of EDM and house. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I'm in, if I'm in a plastics OR, if they're not already playing the music, which they probably are, as, mm. as it sounded like your experience was, then then EDM would be my playlist of choice. Anything EDM, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter. <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jake in the comments here asked a question about uh, pediatric patients. So I actually, uh, if, if I ask pediatric patients if they would like to listen to music, I actually prefer um, to give them an iPhone or to have mom and dad bring an iPhone into the operating room and nice. just play whatever their favorite video is on YouTube, if there's a series that they like to watch, um, so that they don't just have an audio distraction, but also a visual distraction as well um, from what's going on. So for, for kids, usually I'll actually go for video and not audio. I don't know uh, if you have similar experience. Oh, you know, I, I, yeah, I've never thought of, I mean, the music's just playing. Usually we, we, you know, we play a game, like the balloon game and, you know, getting them to blow up the, the balloon as they go off to sleep and then, just slowly kind of doing that thing. I found the, for me at least, the iPad, it's, it's sometimes worked, but other times they, it's just so distant from what's happening here. So they're wondering why I'm putting this mask over the face and that it becomes a bit tricky, but yeah, it's, 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 it's so hard with um, you know, who, who knows which kid's going to respond to what. Um, oh, which types of surgeons have the funniest or best taste of music in your opinion? Oh, one of our plastic surgeons, he had the most, interesting playlist just because it went from some random classical song to Spice Girls to something a bit more cool, you know, hip hop and whatever. <laughs> yeah, I've got a, uh, I've got a transplant surgeon who I can introduce you to who has the same spread of music. And I think, I can't, I can't say this with certainty, but I think that he has his transplant surgery fellows mm. take a song or two to add to the playlist every year. So as mm. the years go on, there are contributions from the fellows who have come through. Um, so yeah, it's right. really a, a collection of, it's like a historical collection of music that's been enjoyed <laughs> uh, by yeah. other people. I, yeah. I, yeah, I reckon my, my theater playlist is now, oh, how many songs? It's probably up to 400 or something. Um, but it's, yeah, like it just keeps growing because I just chuck anything that I like on this. Uh, let's see. Oh, 442 songs. There you go. Wow. Wow. Like, I mean, um, we had a, a comment here that the, the ophthalmologists don't have a, a, a funny or remarkable taste of music. Has that been your experience? I mean, they, they've just never heard them put on music. They, they just right. leave it up to me, so I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, my, sister, my sister's an ophthalmologist, and I don't think she's got 
much taste in music. Like, it's not like she talks about music or ghost or sea bands or anything. So maybe you're right. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I believe the person who left that comment is actually my uh, my brother-in-law, who's an ophthalmology yeah. resident. So he could he could comment on his uh, on his taste in music, and she would feel yeah. so bold as to put it in the chat. <laughs> nice. Hey Max, so you know, we, we've gone for about thirty minutes now. Uh, I, like, I, so I'm actually confused about the. Uh, if, if once we stop this live stream, it then just I think it just gets uploaded as a as a video on the ABC's channel. I, I imagine. Yeah. I, yeah, we'll find out. Yeah, we'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or it's, or it's like Snapchat, and then it just disappears forever. Or at uh, least that's how Snapchat worked the last time I used it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Disappears forever. Um, I was thinking, should we, should we, is there anything else to kind of explore in this space or should we get onto other, other controversial things or there we go. Tell me. Um, tell me. <laughs> I mean, if you've got some controversial things teed up, let's, let's get into it. <laughs> I think someone, someone's just asked a question. Uh, is there a difference in music depending on the time of day? What genres are your favorite at nighttime? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, for me, definitely the time of day, like say when I, I usually put on a certain type of music just to get me going. It's usually whatever I'm feeling at the time or in that season. And then through the by the by the end of the day, it definitely changes. So I might switch switch it over to a completely different playlist. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't say I've got any particular styles of music that I like, but just what I feel like at the time, and especially on a night shift, I just need to, you know, be be switched on. So it's nice to have something that you like. Whatever makes me makes me have a good feeling, that's what I'll put on. Yeah. I, I, I'm a little more rigid with my timeline of music. So if it's the evening or late at night, I will make sure to avoid jazz. Oh, yeah. I love jazz and I find it very relaxing, but I, I don't want to be that relaxed. Um, and yes. especially if, it, if it's starting to get late. So I won't play jazz um, in the evening or at night. And if it's getting late into the night, if it's an overnight case, um, anything past midnight, then it's almost certainly EDM, some kind of, some kind of upbeat yeah. dance music that, that has like a four on the floor. Uh, <laughs> keep everyone awake. Keep everyone keep awake. awake. I mean, yeah. what, what they say, like they, they say, if you operate after three o'clock in the morning, you know, patients just do worse. So, you know, you, you, if, you, if you really don't have to, just don't operate overnight. Yeah. yeah. Have, have you done, um, what's it like with the night shifts there? Like, do you... Have many like much operating, much on call overnight. Um, very hit or miss. It totally depends on the night. I don't think there's a good way to generalize. And I, you know, every many people have a tendency, I think, to try and define themselves as a white cloud or a black cloud. Is that terminology that you guys? No. Use? Yeah, yeah. So very commonly, you know, if someone <clears throat> has had a string of, uh, you know, five overnight calls where they were doing cases all night, every night for those calls, they would say, man, I'm really a black cloud. Uh, or, or, you know, vice versa, yeah. if someone slept all the way through the night, five night shifts in a row, they'd say, I'm a white cloud. Um, but I think in reality, it's a bell curve, probably like anything. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it, it just really varies. And that's been my experience at the hospital at, here at Mount Sinai where I trained. And then I also spent a, a brief period of time working as, a, as an attending anesthesiologist. Um, at a different hospital, and then and now where I'm doing a fellowship. So I, I think it all varies. Yeah, it all varies. Hey, we just got a question in the chat. Actually, there's a, maybe maybe we should just open it up. So for the next five minutes or so, you know, if you have any questions, we'll just uh, answer those questions. Um, someone was asking us, um, how many hours do we work per week? Um, from my point of view, yeah, I do a forty hour week in public, and then do another five to ten hours in private, uh, depending and. Um, yeah, then work on the anesthetic channel stuff in the evenings and on the weekends when, when I feel like it. Yeah. yeah. Can I can I push you on that? How how much time in a month would you say that you work on uh, your on your channel? Ooh, I can I, I can think of it more in weeks. So let's say in a week it would be ten to twenty hours probably. Um, ten and to twenty not, hours a week. Yeah, that's not just on YouTube. That's that's the whole oh. company and stuff. So yeah. You know, Running the lectures and uh, doing Zoom courses and um, yeah, so it, it is a bit. And a lot of it, I can. Some of the stuff has has um, because I've got I've got a lot of education roles in my hospital, so there's a lot of overlap. Like I might create a lecture 
baby seeds that then I can double up and give to the um, my trainees. So there's a lot of good you know synergy with whatever I'm teaching out there. I can always teach uh, in the hospital as well. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah being able to bundle that's pretty good. How, how about yourself? Yeah. So when I was in residency, we had the option of moonlighting. We had a very flexible moonlighting program um, mm-hmm. that that we could sort of do. Uh, you know, PRN moonlight shift on basically any given day unless we were on call. Nice. Um, and so that was something that I took advantage of, not only from a financial standpoint, but from an experiential standpoint. Mm-hmm. I was able to titrate in, you know, more time spent in the hospital, which gave me, I, I think, quite a bit more experience in the OR. Um, <clears throat> and so with the moonlighting, on average, I was probably working 65 to 70 hours a week. Um, mm-hmm. If I had not been electively moonlighting, I probably would have been looking at the 55 to 60 hours a week range. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, but, that's, but I... Yeah. Go ahead, go on. I was just going to say, I, I spend a, quite a bit less time than you on... Um, uh, I, I mean, I realize you have you have multiple uh, outlets or platforms, really, on social media. Um, I just have my, my one channel. Yeah. And I probably, I probably spend... 10 or 15 hours a month on that, you know, so maybe a good. quarter of the time or less. Oh, good. No, that's good. Spend on your I, I'm actually, now I'm actually spending probably less than an hour a month on ABC's Anesthesia YouTube channel. Like it, it's all the other stuff now because I'm, I'm just kind of letting the channel do its thing now. Um, yeah. But, it, but it's, it's probably still my favorite thing because I feel like YouTube is still where everyone goes to learn stuff like, yeah, this whole thing of, you know, I've obviously got stuff on Instagram and TikTok, but just learning through short videos, I just, I just don't really get that for myself, but, but I'll, I'll put it up. I'll put it out there because people obviously watch it and stuff um, and bite-sized information might be useful, but I'm all about strategic frameworks for learning and just like, you know, you've got to have the whole plan. Edutainment yeah. is not something I really uh, got into or I never learned from. Yeah. I dabbled in TikTok and I dabbled a little bit with YouTube shorts, but I just found it was, it was not satisfying to try and pack in the yeah. message that I wanted to convey in a, you know, two yeah. minutes or less. It's yeah, just it's hard. Cool. I made a video about a rapid infusion catheter insertion. Oh. And I just, I mean, that, that, like you can't, you, you can't communicate meaningful information about that in, in 120 seconds. I don't know. Like it's, it's definitely like a clickbaity kind of world where you're just like, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> it was the, the the attention economy. I've just got to grab your attention with a cool sound bite and a you know thumbnail and a, a massive right. You know. Well, and so you know, going back to music, hmm. there there there's this whole world of music now where songs are 15 seconds or less. That's just whatever grips people to watch a I've video never, that it accompanies. I've never heard of that, but I, is that? Is that literally what's happening on, sh- like, um, you know, when you put up a story on Instagram, is that what's happening? Like, some of those free, the free stuff is just... I, 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 admittedly, it's not, it's not really my area of uh, expertise, but I had, I had listened to a podcast that was talking about new music that's being produced and how the focus is on making a 10 or 15 second, you know, clip track sound yeah. bite. Um, that's meant to hook people for the amount of time that someone would watch, you know, exactly. something on on Instagram or TikTok. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Because I definitely know, like, I've made some, I've made some like, nice Instagram reels of holidays I've had, and you know, it just cuts a, a very catchy song into twenty seconds, thirty seconds, or whatever it is, and and it's powerful. You know, like I will ne- every time I hear that song, I just remember where I was, you know, on holiday doing whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a powerful thing. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, the whole thing like uh, music is a soundtrack to our lives. I wonder if that's going to happen with. I've always thought about you know, using music with study, like trying to key in, or trying to link certain songs to certain memories to help memorize tables or whatever it is. I wonder if that's sure. Yeah, I mean, that could be the new. Uh, instead of doing visual mnemonics, it could be uh, song yeah. mnemonics. Yeah, just you know, the whole yeah. time that we've been preparing to to have this live stream. I've yeah. had the the song Down Under stuck in my head, which I used as a as a background track for for the promo that I put up on Instagram. And <laughs> if I had, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm in fellowship for pediatric anesthesia right now. If I had some sort of um, mnemonic for Down Under, they they could be helpful for uh, you know learning pediatric drug dosing. Maybe that would be effective. 
Absolutely. <laughs> anyway, then that's yeah, that's really interesting. Though maybe the, the new the new dimension of uh, yeah of learning that we'll uh, branch out into. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Does anyone have any uh, questions from the audience? This, yeah. By the way, this is a, this is like my first live stream on YouTube, and you've done a couple of these, Max, haven't you? I have done one live stream. Okay. Previously, and I was. Well, that's not true. I did I did one live stream um, with someone else, and then I and I did stream a talk that I gave. Okay, nice one. I think I mean this actually doesn't seem too difficult. I'm, I'm wondering whether I'll just end up doing live streams for all the lectures, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My uh, my wife is a dermatology fellow, and oh, yeah. there are some really excellent dermatology educators who. Um, do live streams on, um, I believe, on Instagram, and they're really popular and a and a really I think valuable study uh, tool for a lot of people who are preparing for their board exams. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I just love the fact that I can, you know, we can just be doing our normal job, teaching or doing whatever, and then someone in another part of the world who wouldn't otherwise have access to this kind of education just gets on YouTube because they, you know, even even in sub-Saharan Africa, you've got. 5G phones, and uh, you know, you just watch and learn. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. I mean, the the way that um, the internet and and social media have made it possible for us to do collaborations like this is also wild. I mean, without YouTube, yeah, uh, right. <laughs> we wouldn't have made this connection. It's, it's just wild how it works. Yeah, that's all good. I'm actually, you know, I can't wait to the day when I'm actually gonna head off to New York, and um, you know, next time you have a, a New York Society conference. Can you let me know? I, I don't get, I don't particularly, I'm not on any kind of email list, but I'll absolutely come and kind of head up to New York and visit you. And Come crash it. It's in December. The New York State Society of Anesthesiology's conference is uh, beginning of December. Can you send me the link or the dates or whatever? Absolutely. I will. I'll let you know. I'll really try to get lead for that. Yeah. <laughs> we should do that. Um, keep me in the loop about any yeah. Australian conferences. Oh, Yep, I'll, I'll send you the ANSCA ASM, which is the big one. It's like four, four or five days. It is epic. There's, there's a, 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 the best part, obviously, they've got international speakers, but I've never been to such epic um, gala balls. They are on another level to what I've ever experienced before. The first time I walked huh. into it, they had a hideout a hall in the exhibition center, a massive hall. They're probably combined halls. Walked in, there's like smoke and jugglers and like the... the <laughs> Able, like I, I could see where all our money was going. This was the most epic display of um, you know, of opulence I've, I've seen to date. <laughs> yeah, Just, I I will say the anesthesia conferences that I've been to in the United States have been a, a, a bit underwhelming. Uh, yeah. Not that they're not worth going to, but yeah. in terms of presentation, nothing nothing wild. Um, the conferences that I have been to that that are. Uh, really attractions unto themselves are the dermatology conferences. As I said, oh, yeah. my wife's a, a, yeah. a dermatology fellow. And so there, there's sort of this subculture of significant others of dermatologists who go to the derm conferences. So you're got, you're I, part of the wags or the, uh, <laughs> what was yeah. it? Husbands and boyfriends, Habs. Yeah, exactly. So there, there's a group of us that, you know, when we when we go to the, the Durham conferences, we meet up, find each other. And, oh, know, nice. Oh, that's, yeah. that's lovely. Can you yeah. meet? But, uh, yeah. but I, I, I will say the, the um, in the U.S., the anesthesia conferences could take a, a pain. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> hey, Max, you've just frozen there. Oh, no, you're back. Good. Hey, well, I think that's I was good... just I was, I was lost in thought thinking about <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Shall we uh, wrap it up and uh, yeah, we'll schedule the next chat about something else in uh, a few weeks time. This is great. Thanks for the awesome. invitation. It's, no it's worries, great eh? to talk with you and uh, I look forward to the next time. Oh, yeah. And everyone who's watching, um, if, you're, if you're not sure, um, so Max Feinstein from Max Feinstein MD, uh, his YouTube channel also has very interesting stuff in anesthesia, so please um, subscribe to his channel if you, if you haven't already. Um, and otherwise, yeah, I'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks for everyone watching.